I'm so excited to be here. I love coming back to Utah. I actually um, recently moved, so it's really fun getting to come back and see my friends. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about how to speed up UX research. And I really wanted to start with my own story of research and how I got into it um, and how I um, fell in love with research. So I was a few years ago working as a quantitative researcher here in Utah, and I really, <laughs> I really enjoyed the work that I did um, and really loved my team. And I could tell you exactly what was going on with our product. I was super confident in that. I felt really engaged and really understood what was happening. Um, but I felt like there was something missing, like any good love story, right? Um, and I really wanted to understand why the things that I was seeing happening in this particular product area that I owned, um, why they were happening, what was really going on. And so I started doing um, some qualitative research. I started doing some customer calls, I'm sure, like many of you do. Um, and I ended up doing a full-on uh, research study with over 20 customers. And for me, it was like this light bulb moment where it was the first time that I not only understood what was happening, but I really on a deep um, and personal level understood what the experience was like for our customers. And because of that, I felt empowered to change our product to make something that really would work for them, these people that I had gotten to know so well through these conversations. Um, and so, I actually, um, this is probably the part of the story that's a little bit unusual, because I'm sure a lot of you do research. Um, I was so excited about this experience that I had had and so excited about um, this process of UX research that I started just like voraciously reading and I started reaching out to everyone who had experience in the field. And I ended up making a podcast. So the podcast is called uh, Mixed Methods, and it's actually grown now. It's a Slack group. We did our first event last week uh, at Airbnb, which was really exciting, co-hosted it with them. Um, and I uh, just, as I said, I had really, really fallen in love with research, and I wanted to learn everything that I could about it. And I, um, the first episode that I published for the podcast was with someone named Jake Knapp. Maybe some of you are familiar with his work. Um, and he wrote this book, Sprint. And so as I was preparing for this conversation today, I was thinking about Jake, because I think more than anyone, uh, when it comes to doing design quickly, doing uh, you know, a quick process, Jake has really become well known for this. And when we sat down in the GV office to record our conversation, Jake started telling me how he had come to the Sprint process. And for him, what he had seen was that he actually did his best work, not when he had like a long extended period of time, um, but when he had a really clear goal um, and he had a short amount of time. And you see this in the sprint methodology that he and others um, on the GV team ended up developing because they, they tested this idea um, with groups of people, right? So Jake didn't just assume that his experience would be true for everyone. They actually tried longer sprints. So they tried doing sprints that were as long as six weeks, and they tried doing sprints that were as short as just a couple days. And what they found was that there was this sweet spot because when they had um, six week long sprints, the teams actually didn't get more done than they did in this five day period. They kind of got distracted, they lost continuity on the weekends, um, and when they had these really short sprints, they didn't have time to test the designs that they had come up with. And this was a really, really key part of the sprint methodology and process, and added a lot of value. As you can see, it even says it on the cover. Um, and so, uh, you know, I thought that this was a really good example of the fact that there is value in speed, because I think sometimes, you know, when we get a project and we're told it needs to be done really quick, we kind of push back, right? And I think that there is a sweet spot, um, and we need to be aware of this. And, and this is true not even just in technology. I love the quote by um, the great American composer Leonard Bernstein. He says, to achieve great things, two things are needed, a plan and not quite enough time. Um, and, and this is backed up, actually, by psychology as well. So what Leonard Bernstein and Jake Knapp are talking about is a principle that psychologists call scarcity. And basically what we see happen is that when we don't have enough, um, we tend to do a couple things. We focus. This is a picture I took a couple days ago at work in one of our hallways. Um, we focus and we prioritize. And you can imagine that when we're, when we're working, being able to focus and prioritize are really helpful, right? They, they actually do allow us to do our jobs better. So I wanted to start by giving that context before I jump into a couple things that I have seen um, personally really um, 
not only make my work go faster, but as I mentioned, like I've had a chance to talk to a lot of people at a lot of research organizations. So these are the things that I've seen um, that have allowed them to uh, speed up their research process and really do the most, um, the most efficient uh, work. So the first one that I want to talk about is infrastructure. So I know this isn't the most interesting uh, thing that I could put up first, but I just can't emphasize this enough. When you look at any of the best um, research organizations in the world, so world-class research organizations, one thing that you will consistently find across the board is that they have created an infrastructure that allows them to move really quickly. And, um, you know, this is true not even just for research, again. Uh, you know, I have a friend who's gotten really into bread baking. Right? And so if you had looked at her kitchen six months ago, it looked very different, right? She probably had the flour behind the sugar, et cetera, et cetera. And if you go into her kitchen today, it looks completely different. She has a dedicated counter space that she keeps clear for rolling out her flour. She has her ingredients in uh, locations that are easy to access. She has her oven mitts in a really specific spot because she knows that she needs to be able to quickly grab them out. And that's the principle that I really want us to think about as we set up our research organizations. How can we put the right ingredients ingredients in the right places so that we can grab them out quickly instead of getting hung up on what I like to call small change tasks that actually can suck up a ton of our time um, when we're doing research. So the three uh, like small change tasks that I want to highlight for you that I would suggest um, focusing on first as an organization trying to set up this infrastructure um, are to start budget. So if you spend weeks trying to get approval for a couple hundred dollars of incentives and then complain that your researchers aren't moving that fast, I would maybe take a look in the mirror and have a, have a moment um, and set up a budget. You just cut. I've had projects where I literally ended up wasting about two weeks just to get approval for probably like $500. So um, yeah, we just cut out a couple weeks. The next one is recruiting support. So this is a huge one. <coughs> and there's a variety of different types of solutions here. So if you uh, work at Google, if you're a researcher, they actually have a whole team dedicated to just finding you participants because it can be really difficult, especially when you are looking for a very specific group, which is often where you find the most value, right, is when you're recruiting exactly who you need. So that admin who's 25 to 35 and lives in Wisconsin and likes to play lacrosse or whatever. Like, you can get really specific, and it's amazing when you have a team to help you um, do this quickly and move through it quickly. But on the other end of uh, the spectrum, for those of us who don't work at Google, you can do things like just set up lists. So let's say that you work at an organization, um, maybe you have one researcher, maybe you're doing the research yourself. Just get lists in place, lists of customers that have the main attributes that your researchers will need to filter based on. Um, get a list of new hires if you want to be able to really, really quickly um, get some usability feedback. That way, um, when your researcher has a project and you know, only has a few days to turn it around because you need to move forward, they're not slowed down waiting for weeks trying to figure out who the data scientist is, who can get them that list. So this one I can't emphasize enough. And the third one is tools. Um, so there are so many different tools out there um, for doing UX research. And I want to just call out a couple. Um, so one is comes back to this recruiting idea, right? There are scheduling tools, because you can spend weeks going back and forth on emails. There are tools to help you, uh, user testing, um, user zoom, all sorts of tools to help you do research really quickly. So I think these are the three key ingredients that I've seen in the infrastructure of organizations that are moving really quickly. Another thing that I've seen, um, because these apply across the board, right? No matter who you are, where you are doing research, you need to set up some kind of infrastructure for yourself. But another thing that I've seen as I've been going out and meeting these different um, people at organizations all over is that people have created programs. And the reason people create programs is because they have specific problems. So the infrastructure um, that we just talked about, as I said, it applies to everyone. Everyone needs to set up an infrastructure. But these programs came about because specific organizations were solving specific problems that they faced. So the first problem was quick projects um, were delayed by longer projects. 
So you can imagine, if you're doing long-term strategic research, maybe you're taking a team to China because you want to understand how job seekers network. Obviously, I work at LinkedIn. Um, that's, a, that's a long project that's going to take a while. And you might have a ton of usability needs that come in throughout that longer project. Well, what happens? If you don't have a program or some kind of solution set up, probably what will happen is those other projects will be delayed, or maybe they'll just forego doing research at all. Um, so what I saw was that this was a problem that Google was facing, and what they came up with was a program called Rapid Research. Um, and if you want to read about like, the very, very specific details, Heidi Sales, who um, leads one of these teams in Washington, actually wrote an article on the mixed methods medium, and she gets into like, all of the nitty gritty. But the high level idea is that you create a dedicated team. So this idea has actually been so successful at Google that they've now made multiple rapid research teams. But they have specific teams where all they do is turn around research projects in a week. So you come on a Friday and you say, I have this question. I don't know if this product that I've you know, designed is usable. Help me. A week later, they come back and give you results. So there's obviously trade-offs, right? Um, but this is the solution that they've come up with, and it's been really successful for them. So another problem. Recruiting takes time. So this is a problem that Facebook was dealing with. So as I mentioned, recruiting takes time. And sometimes you have a recruit that needs to be really specific, like the one I was mentioning. And sometimes you have a recruit that isn't very specific. Maybe you just need to talk to active members who are about here, right? And by about here, I mean usually an age range, age range and like a mixed mix of different genders or something. So Facebook found that they didn't always need to spend so much time doing these really custom recruits. And so they made this program called Rolling Research, where every other week on a Friday, they would set up five sessions, and they would allow three projects to sign up for those five sessions. And this allowed them to not get held up saying, hey, I've got this project. OK, great, I'm going to set up a recruit. Two weeks later, you can, you know, we can execute on your project. So they were, allowed to, they were able to speed up their project a lot. Um, and again, there's a full article if you want to get more into the details of specifically how they did this on Medium on the Facebook research uh, publication. But uh, another thing I want to call out about this program really quickly is that you know, these programs, like we need to think about ways to apply them to ourselves, right? Like we're not all Googles and Facebooks, um, luckily or unluckily. Um, and so we need to figure out ways that they can apply to us, right? Maybe we don't need to do it every other Friday. Maybe we need to do it once a month. With the Google program, maybe we don't have the ability to actually have a full-time dedicated researcher um, working on just rapid programs, but maybe we could split up our time in a way that allowed us to um, get those same benefits for our smaller organization. So a third program, a third problem that I want to talk about is more designers than researchers. So this is a problem that LinkedIn was facing. Um, and at our, at our organization, probably like many of yours, um, we have a lot more designers than researchers. I don't think I ever uh, met a researcher here in Utah who had more than like one person on their team. Like, if you have more than one person on your team, talk to me after, because I'm curious. Um, but so I think this is a problem that a lot of us face. So what LinkedIn did, did was they actually set up an infrastructure so that designers could really quickly pick up and do the work um, themselves on certain projects. So they created templates. They um, specifically helped them resource space in our UX lab. They gave them dedicated, um, like a dedicated budget for it, so incentives. Um, and they also gave them time with researchers to go over their discussion guide, to be able to QA it. Um, and this program gets used all the time. We have so many projects at LinkedIn. It's like the team is growing very, very quickly because there is this huge demand and it's become such an integral part of our product development process, which is amazing. But it means that there's a lot of projects that we can't get to. And so I found that this program has become, this program among a number of others, honestly, that we have has become really, really crucial to us being able to do the work that we need to do and keep the quality um, of user research that we want. So the next thing that I want to talk about, we've talked about infrastructure, we've talked about programs, um, and those are more at an organizational level. So there's a couple other things that I want to talk about that are really more at a project level that I've seen really, really help my projects um, to move more quickly. Um, and the first one is have a clear behavior-based objective. So what do I mean by this? Um, a few weeks ago, I'll give you an example. A few weeks ago, I was working on a project um, with my team 
And it's a new product. Our product executive team is really excited about it. Um, and so we're all also really excited. And we took it into the lab. And the thing that I felt like set this project apart was that we had a really clear behavior-based objective. So we weren't just trying to understand if concept A was better than concept B or better than concept C. We were trying to understand if the admins that we were building this for were more interested in being able to quickly execute or if they were more interested in being able to explore. And so when we went into the lab, and all of us were there together for two full days, we were able to see by the way that our admins interacted, not which they liked more, not which they thought was cooler, but actually which allowed them to do their job better, which was the one that they gravitated towards and why. Um, and it really changed the, the tone of the conversation that we had, because I think a lot of times something else that comes into play is, um, you know, well, I don't really care what a participant likes. Neither do researchers. Like, we sh it really should be, the stuff that we're doing should be very much behavior-based. Um, and so I found that this changes the conversation and also gives you a lot of clarity as you're moving through the research process. Um, the other thing that I feel like that project in particular um, emphasizes and that I have found to be so, so crucial is get team alignment. So as I mentioned, all of us were there for two full days. And I think this is also um, very much shown in the design sprints that I mentioned before, um, Jake Knapp's methodology. Like, when they do a design sprint, it isn't optional to come for one day or maybe come for three days. Because what ends up happening is it adds in all of this communication waste. And I'm sure that we're all very familiar with this. And what I mean is I learn something and then I write you an email about it, and then you write me an email back asking some clarifying questions, and then I write you an email back clarifying those questions, and round and round and round we go, and then we wonder, why does it take so long? And often it takes so long because we add in these unnecessary, uh, unnecessary steps, right? So when we have team alignment, when we're there in the room together, um, it allows us to move so much more quickly. And actually on this particular project, we were using something called a right me methodology. So right is R-I-T-E. Um, and it means rapid iterative testing and evaluation. And so we were able through the course of two days to not only learn about our customers, but actually iterate on our designs and come out at the end of those days with a product that was different than what we went in, but felt very, very much aligned to what we were learning along the way. And there's no way that we could have done that if all of us hadn't been in the room together. Because what would have happened? We would have learned something. We would have spent that two days just learning something, and then we would have met up with our PM, and then we would have set up more tests to test the designs that we thought we should change. But because we we're all there together, um, we were really able to move so quickly. And also, just on a personal note, I feel like um, when you do this, it just changes the dynamic so much of your team because you're working on a project together. You're not trying to like prove something to one another. You're not, um, you know, kind of like stopping and starting. Um, it just really allows you to create a smooth flow of your project. So I can't emphasize this enough. Okay, so. We know that we can speed up research by um, having infrastructure, programs, a clear objective, and team alignment. And this is particularly true, like we really can get these speed benefits when we're doing certain types of research. So by certain types of research, I mean evaluative. Um, I don't know if I have a laser pointer, I wish I did. But so evaluative is usually the type of work that we do later on in the design cycle, right? We already know what we think uh, our customers want or need. Um, and so we're able to test and see, is this, did I design this thing right? Whereas foundational research is the stuff that we do earlier on. It's when we're asking the question, am I designing the right, like, am I designing the right thing at all? Not am I, you know, designing it in the right way? Um, and when we're doing foundational research, we need to be really careful about emphasizing or overemphasizing speed. Because it's at this moment um, in the research project that we really, really need to be focusing on quality. Um, and you know, an, an analogy that I love when thinking about quality is a Thanksgiving turkey. So imagine trying to cook a Thanksgiving turkey in 30 minutes. Like it's just not gonna work. It's gonna be gross and Everyone's going to get sick. So let's remember that there are certain types of projects that are like a Thanksgiving turkey, and we need to just give them time, right? Maybe you're taking your team to do contextual inquiry around the country. Um, you need time. And you know, maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, I wanted to do a project like this, and, and I heard we don't have time for research. Well, I want to challenge that, because I think that typically when we hear we don't have time for research, what we actually hear is research isn't a priority, 
right? We're not making time, we're not prioritizing it. And I think there are a few common reasons that this might happen. So maybe research isn't valuable. Maybe your organization or the people that you work with think research just isn't valuable, right? We don't need it, it's a waste. So I wanna tell a quick story. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Air Bed and Breakfast, or what was formerly, the company formerly known as Air Bed and Breakfast. Um, and so this company started in 2008, right? We heard from Ben this morning, an amazing designer there. Um, and they were doing really bad. Okay, so it's 2009, a year later, they're making $200 a week. They're actually doing so badly that they decide instead of focusing on the bed part, they're gonna focus on the breakfast part. And they start making specialty cereals and they make more money on the specialty cereals at this point in the, the history of the company on the breakfast. They make 40 grand selling these, hot gluing them by hand. Um, so what happened, right? Like, we're not buying cereal from Airbnb today, so what happened? Well, what happened was they had a conversation with one of their investors, Paul Graham, and this has become such a crucial part of the story of Airbnb. Because Paul said to them, go to your users. Go to your users. You don't know what's going on. You don't, you don't understand the experience they're having. And so they started splitting their weeks and actually spending part of every week in New York because that's where they had the most people using their platform. And I love this quote from Brian Chesky. He says, I used to joke that when you bought an iPhone, Steve Jobs didn't come sleep on your couch, but I did. So they were actually going and staying in the homes of the people that were using their service. And this is a method called contextual inquiry, right? This is a foundational method. And Brian goes on to say that they actually wrote their product roadmap based on this foundational research that they were doing. And we all know that now, uh, you know, it isn't Air Bed and Breakfast, it's Airbnb. It's a company that's worth approximately $31 billion. And when you look at their methodology, this is really the moment. This is where the tide turned. Um, and this is a quote from Paul Graham, that investor that I mentioned, because he really, really emphasizes the value of research. He says, in practice, to get good design, you have to get close and stay close to your users. You have to calibrate ideas on actual users constantly, especially in the beginning. So, okay. You know, maybe you're not prioritizing research because it's not valuable. Well, we know that it is valuable, so that's not the reason. Maybe you're not prioritizing it or your organization isn't prioritizing it because there's nothing more to learn, right? They like know everything. Maybe they're a visionary. Maybe they are the user. They don't feel like there's anything more to learn from doing this research. Um, so I wanna tell you another story. It's 2001, let's all imagine. Um, and we are starting to hear rumors about this amazing product. It's codenamed Ginger. Sometimes people are just calling it it. Jeff Bezos says that, is investing in it. Steve Jobs says that it is going to be as big as the personal computer in a Times Magazine article. So obviously we're all on the edge of our seats, right? Like waiting to see what is this product that cities are gonna be designed around in the future that's gonna change all of our lives. So what was it? It was the Segway. Here's a photo um, of the inventor, Dean Common, riding one. But I can't, I, I'm guessing that none of us rode a Segway here today. Um, so what happened? What happened? Why, why aren't we all riding Segways? And I think that what happened was that Dean Common left out or neglected something very important. He neglected context. And when we're trying to change human behavior, we have to understand human behavior. And the way we understand that is by understanding the context that people are acting in, right? So Erica Hall says, where humans are concerned, context is everything. So what Dean Common missed was the streets, the commutes, the lifestyles of these people that were gonna be using the Segway. He didn't understand how people were actually gonna be using it in their everyday lives. His team thought there was nothing more to learn, and they obviously learned that they were wrong. Um, okay, so the third thing. Maybe your team isn't interested in doing research because they feel like research isn't trustworthy, right? At this point, we know research is valuable. We know that there's more to learn by doing it, but maybe they feel like well, what can I learn from six people, right? So my answer to this is be honest. Be really honest about the limitations. I interviewed um, Matt Gallivan, who's a research manager at Airbnb now, but formerly uh, worked at Facebook, and I loved this story that he told me. Um, he was asked to participate in what is called a Zuck review. So you guys can probably guess what it is, but basically uh, Mark Zuckerberg had these uh, regular product reviews. So people would come and they would present their product and they would present their research that really fed into that product and got them to where they were. 
And so Matt shows up to this product review, and the person who goes before him is a data scientist. And they have N equals something insane, like 100 million people or like a billion people. And, and then Matt gets up, and he shows his slide, and it says N equals six. And apparently Mark Zuckerberg laughed a little bit, which I mean, I can imagine, right? Like we probably all had that same thought. And, but here's the thing, right? Like let's think back on these two stories that I just told you. Quantitative research can only tell you so much. It can tell you what's happening, but it can't tell you why it's happening or the experience that the people who are behind those numbers are having, right? So quantitative research wouldn't have changed Airbed and Breakfast to Airbnb as we know it today. Quantitative research wouldn't have allowed the Segway to be the amazing product innovation that it was supposed to be, according to you know, the tech giants of our time. What would have? Qualitative research. Think about the difference that even six interviews um, you know, for Segway could have made, riding around, following six people as they went about their day on a Segway. So much could have been learned. So I think we need to be really careful to not equate our sample size with the value that that sample size can produce. Um, so be really honest about it, right? I think there's a beautiful pairing that happens between quantitative research that allows us to really identify and dig in and find these problems, and qualitative research that allows us to color in the lines and understand what's going on with the person behind the number. So, okay. We started with we don't have time. We understood that really probably what we were saying is that research isn't a priority. Um, we discussed the main reasons that maybe your team or organization has felt like that. Um, so hopefully at this point, something in this talk will allow you to go back to your organization and cross that off and say, we'll make time because research is a priority or should be a priority for our organization. And that's, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>